Also, over the years, I've figured out, besides characterizing, to sort out just how well my antenna is working. And, you know, that's every day when you fire up. The first thing I think about is, how's my antenna working? <laughs> I should know by now. And so one way is, am I one of the few stations that's still on the air talking as the band is closing out? That's one way to know. Another way that I, works really good for me is I'll be QSOing with some locals within about a 50 mile radius and I, I'm 160 or 80, 75 and uh, I'll dial in an SDR they see we're about four or five hundred miles away and I'll watch all of our signals on there while we're talking and I've had one station that has equaled my signal level so far it's been about a year doing that one station rest of, a lot of the rest of them are almost down in the mud at that distance and my signal's been over his night in all cases um, and the third way that I've noticed recently is, is I'll get on the air and just make a quick contact with a signal report. Who's ever done that before? And they'll say, how much power are you running? And I also do quite a bit of AM work and I'll uh, fire up my AM transmitter and tune it up and not modulate, just tune it up and then shut it off. And uh, I'll get a station to come on and say, hi Gary. <laughs> yeah, they know who it is and it's because of sleep level. So would you like to see a, why don't I play, the, we, we have a demo of Simnek on our, uh, in our store. So how about, would you like to see that? Yeah. Okay. Idea of talking than me talking. Hi, this is Gary K7 EMF at True Ladder Line. This morning we're going to uh, take a look at Simnec 2.1. All of you who have received our circuit files for Simnec and using 2.1, you'll need a new set of files in order for 2.1 to function. So if you uh, do need them, contact me and I'd be happy to uh, email them to you. So now let's take a look at Simnet 2.1, Antenna and System Modeling Software. Okay, we've just started uh, Simnet, so we're going to load a circuit. So we click on File, Load Circuit. And we select and we find find uh, the file we're looking for, which is inverted V dash B A L A T U, which is inverted V with a balanced A T U. Should be a file that I have emailed to you, and uh, it should have a dash F after it, indicating that it uh, operates in feet. So we'll load that file, and now we're set up and running. First thing we do is set our wire size, and for mine it's going to be 16G for 16 gauge. The next box down is RH, which is the right hand leg height above ground. I'm going to make that 20 feet. Hit the tab button. The left hand height above ground end of the antenna is 20 feet. Hit the tab button to enter. The length of my antenna, my dipole, is 215 feet tab to enter and my height above ground at the feed point the center in the antenna is 50 and tab okay the ladder line we have it set up for 600 ohm if we want to change that we left click on it and we have a pull down and uh, I'm going to leave it at double click on it leave it at 600 and then in this box we load the length of the ladder line in my case 45 feet and uh, now we're ready to tune the antenna. 
So the C1 block would be the capacitor in the ATU circuit. The A block would be the two roller inductors. This is a balanced ATU. And uh, so we're going to tune in order to get the resultant impedance, which is over here on the Smith chart, is represented by this circle, which we want to be located right at the 50 ohm spot, right in the middle, non reactive. So, first thing we're going to do is we know we've got to increase the capacity, so I'm going to click on the capacity box, push the up arrow. There should be a P after it indicating picofarads. You notice as I increase it, you can see what's going on in the Smith chart. Now I'm going to reduce the uh, inductance on the rollers, and we're bringing it around. That's looking good. And then we uh, increase the capacity a little more and get it out to the 50 ohm circle on the Smith chart. Reduce the inductance, and we're coming around, we're tuning, tuning. And we have resolution at 1.02 to 1. You can see up in the G box. Frequency is 1.9 megahertz, our transmitter generator frequency. And in the parentheses here, we have 1,000 indicating 1,000 watts. So, so we move over underneath the B block. If you follow my mouse, we're putting 940 watts into the antenna, which would be 94% efficiency. We're dumping 54 watts into the feed line, the true ladder line. The capacitor is dissipating 4.8 watts. The roller inductors are dissipating 4.8 milliwatts. So now let's go to uh, 75 meters. We'll go 3.9 megahertz. And we'll tune again. We know we've got to reduce the capacity, so I click on the capacitor box, push the down arrow to reduce the value of our capacitor. We can see it changing on the Smith chart. And we're going to take it down here. We know it's going to be a low number. And then we're going to uh, adjust the uh, roller inductors. So I clicked on the uh, Micro Henry box and bringing that down. It's coming down nicely. And uh, now we Run this on down. Okay, there we're on the 50 ohm circle. Increase the roller inductors a little bit. And we have a resolution. If you look over here, 983 watts to the antenna, 98.3% efficient. But look, we have a problem right here. Our uh, capacitor is at 9.2 picofarads. The ATU4K minimum with the vacuum variable is 10 picofarads. So that's not going to work so well, or it'll work, but it'll be on the ragged edge. So let's uh, exercise one of our tools. Let's change this from 600 ohm line to our 450 true ladder line that we just came out on the market with recently. And um, and then from experience, I'm going to change the capacitor mode by dragging and dropping the C1 to the other side of the roller inductor. So we just switched impedance modes. Now I'm going to reduce the inductance and increase the capacitance by holding the up key. And you see now it's starting to come in. Okay, so you notice over here, see the green color of the C1 uh, block? You notice the green trace here. This is the actually the effect of the capacitor. And the purple is the effect of the uh, roller inductors. So now you see as we change this, I'm sorry, we go to our roller inductors. We're at 4.7 microhenries. We increase that. You see how it swings it in this direction. If we decrease it, it's, it uh, swings the phase, and there we have a resolution. So we take a look at this. We have 4.4 microhenries, which is in the range of the roller inductor in the ATU. 629 picofarad, which is quite nicely in the range. Our efficiency 93.98, slightly lower than before but we have a nice resolution, so we will probably leave it there. So now, 
Let's go to, let's take a look at the uh, antenna, see what kind of a pattern we have. Roll, use our mouse wheel to scroll out. We're looking straight down on the antenna. And uh, we're going to change the, um, there we go. Okay, now, okay, we're still looking down on the antenna. The red is the highest intensity, so I'm going to tilt this around where you can see the blue is the inverted V. And now we're moving it around, so we're looking at it from the horizon. So now we're looking at the side of the antenna. See, it's our high intensity uh, field is up straight up at the top, and that is because of our height above ground. And uh, we can we can see what we have here. So, so I'm going to we're going to s rotate this sideways, and we can see that there's uh, not a whole lot of difference uh, off of the ends of the antenna. We don't have the null like we would with um, a flat top. And you see that we have a almost an anomaly pattern. Not quite, but pretty close. This is what we would expect. So now let's go to uh, 20 meters, 14.2, we'll say. And uh, let's go back here again and look at the uh, pattern. Oh, we got quite a different pattern now. I'm going to zoom in with a mouse wheel. And there's our pattern. The reason the amplitude is down is because I've not resolved the impedance with the ATU. There's looking straight down from the top down toward from the top down to the antenna, and this is looking from it on the side, which would be the horizon. So you can see these lobes right here are pointing almost at the horizon. So it's got a nice low angle. And it also has a high angle radiation. So that give you an idea of what this antenna the radiation pattern envelope looks like. So there you have it. Simnec 2.1. Simnec 2.1 requires the new files that we are sending out. So if you have the older files that I sent you. If you want to uh, use Simnac 2.1, you'll need the new ones, so uh, just let me know, and I will uh, email you the, uh, the new files. And if you're new to this, we also offer free antenna system modeling if you don't want to uh, jump into this quite this deep. And uh, th there's no charge for this. We're happy to help out. So let, just send me an email if you would uh, like some help with this. If you want to do this yourself, SimNEC is free of charge. And if you go to our product categories and over on the left, you'll see SimNEC Antenna System Modeling Free. Click on that and then click on More Details over to the right. Scroll down and you'll see a link where you can find SimNEC for free and download it. And at the same time, click on uh, the cart and purchase SimNEC, which will cost you nothing. That will give me your contact information and I will email you these files and you'll be up and running. We have a question. Yeah, I was just going to ask you if you had a one to one balance in that, how would that yes. affect your yes. model? It's a one to one. Oh. Yep. It's, it's in there, is it one of the blocks in there? Actually, it's uh, with SimNEC. Uh, and using the balance, the two inductors, row inductors in the circuit, we don't have to put the ballon in. Okay. But it is assumed that there is a ballon in the, our ATU 4K has a ballon on the input to the ATU, as well as the Palstar PT-1500A, it's a balanced ATU and it has a ballon on the input, that's where the ballon should be, so the ballon is always in a one-to-one, -one no reflective power part of the circuit. Good question. Yes. Uh, I have a question for uh, I'll try to answer. For those of us that are for the situation. Could you stand up? Sure. Have a heart.
concrete, the block is filled with you know, concrete and right. bar. You know, there are holes in the exterior walls. So the only way we can get a transmission line out of the house is to go up the drywall behind the radio, down the attic, and down to the soft and down. Right. So the coax, if you do that, if you do that with your transmission line, good question. Good question. Uh, let me uh, get out of this. If you go to, when you have a chance, go to our website, trueladderline.com, and find my mouse, and click on Read First. This is a discussion about best ways to implement ladder line, of course, the antenna. Starts with number one is the, is the preferred choice. The majority of our customers go out of their shack with coax, and they hit a ballon outside, and then the ballon feeds the ladder line at some point outside under their eave or, or thereabouts. We recommend that you use as short a possible coax if, as you can, in other words, get that balance as close to the shack as you can to reduce that coax length. Because remember, that coax is in the high SWR part of the circuit. So that represents efficiency issues. Namely, it turns into a space heater. So we, we don't want so much of a space heater if we can help it. The, um, in my case, I have to be, I, I have a long run. I can't get my ladder line into the shack. So, I have an extremely long run, and I'm using 200 feet of coax. I'm using half-inch hard line, and I also have an LMR 400 run, which is within about three tenths of a dB of loss to that half-inch. So LMR 400 is is very efficient coax. That's if it's operating in a one-to-one -one situation, and that's what I'm doing because I locate my ETU out at the base of the tower. And go out with coax so that coax, the, the half inch hard line or LMR 400, is always seeing a one to one match. That means that the matched losses table apply only, no mismatch losses. So I'm showing with my half inch hard line a little under a dB of loss total in that run at four megs. The LMR 400 is just a touch over 1 dB, which is tall. Uh, and then it hits the ATU, balanced ATU. The ATU then feeds the ladder line up to the antenna, the feed point of the antenna. So now I have to remotely control this thing, obviously. So that's the reason why we invented the stepper tune BT several years ago, and we've sold these all over the world. It is designed to control two stepper motors to control the balance ATU, or it can also control a T network with a differential cap, a differential tuner. Dalstar also markets one of those. And I started with one of those, then I built my own. And then I realized that running high power and high duty cycle, that the with the T network and the balance on the output. Here again, Ballon is in a high SWR part of the circuit, and that Ballon started heating up on me and me. I didn't realize it until we moved to Arizona from northeastern Washington, where it's cooler, down in Arizona, higher ambient temperature, all of a sudden I'm drawn away like that video we saw. <laughs> I look over and my SWR is just doing this. So I hit the panic button, and Went outside, opened up my ATU, and I couldn't hold my fingers on the bell. It was so hot. So I said, here we go again. So that's when I switched over to the balance ATU. I ripped all that stuff out there that I built. I had a Gates roller inductor in there with half inch, uh, edge wound half inch on the side. And would you believe that thing was heating up? So I said, this is, this has got to go. So then I switched over to the balanced ATU, and that's what got us going building the, the ATU 4K. So when I was testing the ATU 4K, I put a thousand watts to I cranked up my broadcast transmitter to one kilowatt carrier, and just let it cook. 
ran it for 20 minutes straight, went out with the infrared gun. The ballon had raised one degree above ambient, and the roller inductors were at ambient temperature. So then I realized that back to this efficiency thing, this was before I had SINMEC. So I was basically flying by the seat of my pants at that point, and I just happened to stumble onto the solution. So that's the re one of the reasons why we're here today, is to, to share that with you. So if you don't want to put the ATU out there, which is a pain, out in weather, got to remotely control it, then the next best would be to put the ballon in. I prefer a one-to-one -one ballon if at all possible. Here again, our company is about antenna system efficiency. That's what we're all about. We are not into smoke and mirrors and all that stuff. System efficiency, period. So we don't recommend putting the ballon outside, but we have a lot of customers that do it, and, and I've seen some decent numbers, efficiency numbers, with it outside if you can keep that coax run as short as possible in high quality coax. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's very nice. Good. Any other questions? Back here, please. I have an old fashioned heat can air mount ballon that I would run near the window. Right. And then I have maybe 15 feet of coax uh, and then I I do, I do, and I've used them. Uh, from what I've what I've studied, is the answer is no. The air wand is not as good as a, as a bifolar or a uh, current ballon, coaxial wand ballon. So I would probably switch over if it were me. Switch over to a chloride ballon. Yes. Yeah, and I would try to stay one to one. A lot of the hands use four to one. The manufacturers put a 4-1 in their ATUs. I do my best to stay away from them because the efficiency again goes down. There was another question. Yes. Could you comment on NFAC where you can't really put a dipole on? Yes. Yes. Uh, anytime you're feeding an antenna that has a counterpoise like radials that sort of thing, your losses go up, and there's no way around it. That's the reason why broadcast stations put out 120 radios all the way around. And they do that because they have to meet a minimum field strength requirement, volts per meter, on their city of service. And if they can't meet that, they can't show it by the FCC charts, and they don't get a license. So, and I've done quite a bit of experimenting with full-size verticals on, on uh, 75 and 80 meters, using the whole tower and radials out. And I've compared it to my true ladder line dipole. And in all but one case, one case the vertical outperformed it. In other cases, I couldn't even hear the station with the vertical. And with the dipole, it was perfectly Q5 in a lot of cases which surprised me. If you are going to run a vertical, you want to get your radials up above ground. Because the radials laying on the ground causes you have ground losses and you're dumping power into the ground. And uh, effective broadcast stations will have their radials way up high. And you don't see those very often because they're a terrible thing to maintain. So how do you, hang on a second. So what do you do? I would recommend if you absolutely have to feed, an end, do an end fed. I see in the ARRL handbook they recommend just letting one leg of the ladder line hang loose. I tried that and I was not impressed. So I would try to figure out a way to get that ladder line, if you're going to use ladder line, out and into the middle of it. You can 
you can run it down and you can run it horizontal. You've got to keep ladder line a couple of feet away from large metallic objects in the ground. And if you do that, chances are you'll have a working situation. Or locate your ATU out underneath your antenna at the center point of the antenna down near the ground. For field day, that's what I set up. And I'll tell you what, it works on field day. Is that what you're thinking? Well, the other thing would be an off center fed. Okay, off center fed antenna. I hear a lot about those. And I've used them myself. I don't anymore. 